The Canadian Football League is one of the very few uniquely Canadian institutions in our country. And joining us now to discuss how the league in some ways mirrors Canada, here's Mark Cohan, the commissioner of the CFL. Kamish, good to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. Before we talk about the 100th Grey Cup, I want those of our viewers who are not big football fans or sports fans at all, frankly, or who are new Canadians and maybe don't follow football that much, to understand that the game over which you preside is played in Canada, mm -hmm. and it's also played in the United States, but they're really very different games. Absolutely. We both play football but it's night and day. Absolutely. What are the differences? Well, number one, our game is older. It's been around for over 100 years. I mean, the Argos go back to the Toronto Argonauts or the Hamilton Tiger Cats go back uh, to 1867 and 1869. Came out of the roots of rugby. So the field's a bigger field compared to our friends south of the 49th parallel. We, uh, it's about 50% bigger. So 110 yards versus 100 yards, 65 yards wide versus 55, 12 men on the field any time versus 11. And the big issue obviously is three downs versus four downs. So it's a game, there's a lot more passing, more scoring, more kicking. And you know, it's a game I love to preside over because I think it's a lot of fun. And at the risk of saying something uh, dicey, I remember an advertising campaign a number of years ago which also pointed out that our balls are bigger. Yes. Now what did that refer to exactly? I, I remember that. So yeah. I, when I first became commissioner uh, six seasons ago, a little over five and a half years ago, I remember seeing that campaign and you know I thought as Canadians sometimes we do too much of trying to compare ourselves to other people, whether and it's the gorilla you know south of the border. Um, and that's what the CFL was doing. They were saying the old football, the J5V, mm -hmm. was bigger than the NFL football. But years ago, our, our footballs became the same size. Wilson, we, all, we still produce it at the same fa factory now. So essentially, the, the campaign was our balls are bigger to say we have bigger balls in the NFL. And I said, you guys, that's ridiculous. You know <laughs> what? We, gotta, we have to be proud of who we are and stop comparing ourselves. So we came up with our new campaign when I became commissioner. So our balls aren't bigger anymore? Nope, they're the exact same size. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have an eight-team league. English is the first language in seven of those eight cities. Montreal Alouettes, of course, playing in a French-speaking city. Does the NFL have anything comparable in the nature of that kind of distinctiveness? Let's put it that way. Um, I don't know. It's hard to tell. I mean, I, I think in terms of the cultural significance, uh, we're different. We're definitely, you know, I, I don't know whether, you know, you go down to New Orleans and there's a sense of, you know, the people who follow the Saints versus who might follow the Rams. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we are a sport that crosses, you know, English and France, East and West, coast to coast. I mean, there was a survey that came out about three years ago that asked Canadians, since the birth of our country, what are defining events? Uh, Canadians said, uh, Confederation, World War One, World War Two, the Battle at Vimy Ridge, and Grey Cup at number seven. Hmm. Uh, pretty powerful testament to what I think the Grey Cup and the CFL means to the country. So I think whether you're an Alouettes fan or soon to be a new Ottawa fan, whether you speak English or French, the Grey Cup really does transcend uh, you know, our culture. It's kind of an unofficial national holiday, isn't it? It's I think it is. That. I think yeah. it really has. Yeah. Let's, I want to go through some of the cities in the, in the country sure. and then go through some of the teams that are in those cities because uh, I think in a very real way the character of the city is often reflected coincidentally enough by the football team. I would agree. <laughs> and I'm going to start, you know, membership has its privileges, so I'm starting with Hamilton. Okay. Uh, once upon a time when I was a kid going to Tiger Cat games, Hamilton was a steel city. Mm -hmm. It was a rugged town. It was a blue collar town. It was a tough town. And so were the Tiger Cats. And now the number one employer in Hamilton is health care. Right. And culture is very big in Hamilton now. Right. And the Tiger Cats suck. <laughs> Coincidence? You said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not happy about it, but I'm telling it like it is. Right, that's true. Uh, well, it's interesting. You're absolutely right. When you think of like the Angela Mosca, the tough guy in Steeltown, that representative. Now we're, we're getting to the point where we're building a new stadium. Health sciences are important. The university, the intellectual or the creative set of sort of is setting into Hamilton. And I think there's a little bit of a renaissance happening there. Um, so it does reflect it, but I still think there's that grittiness uh, to the tiger cats that people love. Uh, interesting, we have done surveys and uh, you know the, the brand affinity or the affinity towards the tiger cats is as strong in the Hamilton region as the riders are in Saskatchewan. Hmm. So it's pretty amazing. I've always said that the tiger cats are essentially the riders of the east and I continue to believe that. Well that's a big deal because of course the riders in Saskatchewan that's the only pro team they've got in the whole province. Absolutely. At and, any level. And you know I've been there where people you know travel four, five, six, seven hours 
to come to a game. There's actually an area uh, by the stadium where they bring, you know, you can bring your RV, you can bring your Winnebago in uh, to uh, sort of camp out for a day before the game. It's pretty remarkable in Saskatchewan. Now let's pick up on that. Okay. Saskatchewan used to be, you know, a have-not province, people leaving every year, and the team was terrible. And both have really turned around now, haven't they? Yeah, and I think you see that throughout our league. But we just did a documentary called The 13th Man. It really talks to the essence of that fan base. Um, they really are remarkable, remarkable fans. And I think the renaissance you're seeing in that team, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there were telethons to try and keep that team alive. <laughs> They're getting a brand new stadium, $280 million that's being built in 2017. We'll be ready for 2017. Um, and I think the, the way that's, that that province uh, is doing from the uranium to potash to all the trying to bring the diaspora of rider fans in Saskatchewan uh, people back to Saskatchewan is reflective in the team and I think there's such a pride and it sort of correlates with how the province is doing. And that is the whole province's team, right? It, it's it not absolutely just, is. It doesn't just belong to Regina. I mean, there have been some talk about, you know, do you ever put a team in Saskatoon? But I think the riders would, uh, would protest that. And I really think it's the whole province's team. Hmm. Conversely, let's go a little bit west. The Edmonton Eskimos, again, when I was a kid, they won five Grey Cups in a row. Yeah. Tom Wilkinson, Warren Moon, absolutely. a lot of great players. Alberta, Peter Lougheed, similarly a powerhouse. Mm. Alberta's running a deficit nowadays, and the Edmonton Eskimos aren't that good anymore. Coincidence again? <laughs> well, I don't know. They lost Ricky Ray, but, you know, they're still battling out. And, you know, we, it, this is, the show is happening, you know, before we know the results, who's going to be in the Grey Cup. You know, there could be a, a potential crossover. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, you look at that time when Lahey and the national energy policy and fighting with Trudeau and, uh, it was the rise of the West. It was the, the five times that the, they won in a row, the Eskimos won in a row. And um, I think that was reflective, reflective of the culture. But hey, the fact of the matter is the Edmonton Eskimos are still a strong team. Uh, and we'll see how they'll do. They are at the box office anyway, right? They still draw very well. They do, they do draw well. Yeah. The Maritimes, still a have-not region in both Canada and the CFL. Still no team in the CFL. Is that ever going to change? It's interesting. That's a, that's a tough question because we've been testing the market. So the last two years, we seeded it with uh, two regular season games. Now, the first regular season game sold out in 36 hours. The second one we did in Moncton as well didn't sell out. I think there's a couple of factors into that. Sorry, sell out would be how many seats? Uh, 21,000. Okay. So nice size, just yep. like you would go to an Owls game in Montreal. Um, I think it's really an interesting opportunity for the CFL because Moncton, and, and this is different than Halifax, Moncton has really positioned itself as the entertainment capital of the region. You know, when, they, when an ACDC concert you know, uh, comes to town, they'll get 70 or 80,000 people to Magnetic Hill there. Hmm. When the Rolling Stones did their tour in North America, the biggest site, the biggest crowds uh, were in Moncton. So when we did our event there, 50% of the audience came from over 80 kilometers, very much like Saskatchewan. So if I think a team could do well there, number one, you have to rebuild the stadium because the stadium in Moncton is small. It's a brand new stadium, but only 10,000 seats. So you have to get it up to 22, 23, kind of like what you'll have in, in Hamilton in the new Tiger Cat Stadium. Uh, but I think the other thing also is you have, probably have to make it a community team, you know, like Saskatchewan, where all the provinces feel they have an ownership uh, in that team. So meaning not kind of one rich guy who owns it, but yeah, lots I mean, of people I, own it? We've had a lot of success when you look at you. We talked about Edmonton, Saskatchewan, uh, you know, the Bombers are all community owned teams. You know, for the people who are watching the show who understand it from the United States, you know, that's like the, the Green Bay Packers. And mm -hmm. I think that's a model that works for our league. It is often said that Canadians don't really appreciate Canada as much as they should. Mm -hmm. Same for the CFL? Mm, I think it's taken time. So I agree with that. So listen, my family moved here in 1967. We were Americans. We adopted this country. And my dad always said to me, Mark, be proud of being a Canadian. Our family chose this country. And I should say who your dad is. Yeah. Know. And my dad was the founder of McDonald's, George Cohan. And, you know, he really adopted this country and, and loves it. Order of Canada, you know, Order of Ontario, really loves this country. And I, I put the first McDonald's in, into Russia. Exactly. And so, you know, that bug, you know, got into me at a very young age, you know, beyond putting the Canadian flag in my backpack and backing, <laughs> pack, backpacking through Europe. You know, I really do love this country. And, you know, one of the things you joked earlier about our balls are bigger. We came out with a campaign about five years ago and said, you know, this is our league. We have to celebrate something that is really important to us. And that's what we've been doing in the gear up to the 100th Grey Cup, whether it's telling the stories of the Grey Cup, um, you know, like the 13th Man or Anthony Calvillo or uh, Chuck Ely, uh, you know, one of the first black quarterbacks in our league 
who won 35 games in a row at the University of Toledo, and the NFL didn't select him because he was a black quarterback, came up here and won a Grey Cup and made his life here. 1972 at 1972. Stadium in Hamilton. You know, and that's a story. I think that's really important. You know, if you think about new Canadians who have been denied opportunities in their home country to come here to succeed, you know, that's what the CFL is all about. That's the Chuck Ely story, and I think that's the connection between, you know, our game and our country. They also say Canada on paper doesn't make sense. In, no, the expression is, it works in reality, but it doesn't in theory. Canada as a country. Canada. Okay. Is that the same with the CFL? It kind of works in reality, but in theory, this as a business proposition makes no sense at all. You're not trying to export your game around the world. Right. You're trying to keep it within the boundaries of a relatively small country in a relatively you know, wide spaces. Does it make sense economically? Well, it's interesting. When you look at the other big professional sports league, whether it's the NHL or the NFL or Major League Baseball with 30 teams, you know, when you have eight teams soon going to nine teams in Ottawa and maybe a tenth team, it is challenging when you're small because you're small because your teams play against each other all the time. And how do you keep it fresh? But the fact of the matter is, there's that sense of pride. There's that pride that this is Canadian. I mean, while we're all rushing now to compete globally where we're just as easily going to trade with India or China or, or Brazil as, a, as opposed to the United States. You know, I think it's important that we pause and reflect and partake in things that are Canadian. So the Grey Cup, the 100th Grey Cup, is a great reflection of that because it gives us that opportunity to come together uh, and really show our pride. This country has had its existence threatened several times along the way, a mm -hmm. couple of world wars, a couple of referendums. Yes. The CFL has had its existence questioned numerous times along the way, mm -hmm. but it's here. How close has it come to going under? I think there's been times in the past, you know, before I was commissioner, where they had major challenges. You know, when you look at the, the mid-90s, uh, when the league expanded into the United States, the teams did well for a short period of time, and then they folded. We had to take a loan from the, NF, uh, from the NFL. We paid back that loan, uh, I think, six months later. Uh, and there's been a resurgence. There's been a, uh, a renaissance happening really in the last five to ten years. So, you know, those old stories about the league having challenges and, and in trouble, th that's not the CFL of today. You know, the CFL of today is over a billion dollars in new stadiums, the second highest TV ratings in this country next to the NHL. Last year's Grey Cup was the second most watched television day in the country after the federal election. You know, we will win that this year, <laughs> you know. Um, well, so you I think, exactly, <laughs> that's why we will win. Uh, so there's so many things that are happening. I mean, I just uh, last week, a few weeks ago, actually visited uh, with the Governor General. The Governor General, um, the Grey Cup is actually, was presented in 1909 by then Governor General Lord Grey uh, to the people of Canada. So we brought the Grey Cup to Rideau Hall and there's so many people now rallying around institutions that are important to this country, and I think the Grey Cup and the CFL is one of those. Having said that, you've got eight teams. Mm -hmm. How many make money? Uh, I would six of eight make money, uh, and then when we get back to uh, Ottawa, you know, with the intention is they make money. But I think these new stadiums being built is going to be a big boost for us. Uh, but you can, you know, many of our teams are public are public because they're community owned. Uh, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders made over four million dollars last year. Um, Bombers, you know, had I think two and a half million dollars, so they're starting to be profitable franchises. That takes us to Toronto, because if there's anything that unites the country, it's hatred of Toronto <laughs> and maybe hatred of the Argonauts as well. Although the Argos haven't been good enough to hate for a very long time. Why do the Argonauts have so much trouble making money in the biggest market in the whole country? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. Now, I've worked for Major League Baseball and the NBA, and if you think about the big market cities in those leagues, it's the Yankees, it's the Chicago Bulls, it's the LA Lakers that do very well. Mm -hmm. We're the reverse. You know, our most profitable team is in Saskatchewan, smaller markets. Um, it has been challenging. I think in Toronto, there's been a couple different things. Number one, it's been change of ownerships over the years. Uh, not really getting to understand what their identity is, you know, that this is about football, this is about community. Our most successful teams reach out to the community and reach really deep in the community, and it's about playing good football. For years and years, you're a Tired Cats fan, you've seen it with the Argos, they play very much defensive-minded football. Uh, and I think they're trying to change that with Ricky Ray a bit, and they've had some success 
uh, in that area. But um, I think there's a lot of work ahead. I think we've got to get to new Canadians. That's one of the things we're working on, and, and one of the things that the Argos are really focused on is how do we get new Canadians into our game. So they're starting to reach, reach out to the Ishmaeli community, uh, to the South Asian community, and really focus on saying, hey, you're a new Canadian. This is important to our country. I want you to come in and experience it. Is the football experience, though, in Toronto still not good enough insofar as it's just never going to feel right with 25,000 people in a 50,000-seat stadium? Do the Argos need their own home, in other words? Well, it's interesting. I think the long-term plan of David Braley and Chris Rudge would be to probably get a new stadium. If you look at the history of sports and the way most uh, teams now are building stadiums, the new Tiger Cat Stadium will be a smaller stadium. Uh, you know, Ottawa will be about 23,000, 24,000. I think eventually to get a smaller stadium, whether that's 10 years out, is probably the right deal for the Argos. Emo Field an option? The problem with BMO Field is it's all grass now, so you can't put the soccer team and the football team on because our boys will chew it up. And oh. the other thing, it's too short. When they built it, um, they built it too short. So you'd have to spend about $30 million to blow it out. But that would be less than you know, building a brand new stadium. Uh, I think the bigger challenge for them has to do with the grass field right now. Okay, let's look at the other capital. We'll talk about the capital of Ontario, capital of the country. Ottawa has had a few franchises over the years. Mm -hmm. Nothing, see, well, of course, the Rough Riders were around for a long time, but then folded. And then was the Renegades. Yep. And then, what am I forgetting? I think that's it. <laughs> then comes the next incarnation, which happens next year or the year uh, after? Well, essentially where we are right now. So uh, a few weeks ago, the uh, Ottawa City Council approved our ownership group in rebuilding Lansdowne Park and Frank Clair Stadium. That's a $500 million project, about $100 million for the stadium. Uh, they will, if the stadium project is on time, the goal is 2014. Okay. And why has Ottawa always had such a tough time supporting football? Again, a capital city. Um, you know, I think it goes down to local ownership. I, you know, having been in sports for 20 years now, I find the most successful teams where you have guys who are rooted in the community, uh, men and women who love their city, and that's what we have now. So the last two owners, last three owners, and when you look at Ottawa, we're all, you know, some were Toronto-based, Detroit-based, Chicago-based, absentee owners. Mm -hmm. You know, for it to be successful, you need people who are supporters not just of the franchise but of the city so guys like roger greenberg john ruddy bill shankman jeff hunt john Pugh, our ownership group what they are are city builders um, these are guys who've given millions of dollars to whether it's the universities or the hospitals uh, and this project that they're doing to bring the cfl back to the nation's capital but also rebuild lands now is a uh, project that rebuilds that city as well and just curious what does it cost to get a cfl team uh, you know, it varies. So, uh, you know, their expansion fee four years ago, five years ago, was about $7 million. Uh, the, the rumored amount, I won't, uh, it was, you know, I won't really give the specifics on it. Uh, the Flames bought the Stampeders or controlling interest, and the, the valuation of that was about $17 million. So the price continues mm -hmm. to go up in the last few years, and um, you've got to be wealthy to own a team now. Do you know what you're going to call the Ottawa team? We don't know yet. And I think what they're going to do is going to reach out to the fans and have a competition and talk to the fans about that. You know, it won't be the Rough Riders, but they want to you know, keep some of the tradition. It might be an R, but they want to keep the colors as well. Won't be Rough Riders, eh? No, it won't. And, you know, and that's interesting because you know, some people said you got two teams with Rough Riders. It's a great to celebrate the past. And that's what we've been doing this whole year with the 100th Great Cup. But I think it's also about launching for the future. So they'll probably come up with a new name. You know, I remember Martin Short doing a bit on The Tonight Show <laughs> once where he went on and he talked about how there were two teams in the CFL named Rough Riders. Right. And you could give the score, Rough Riders 25, Rough Riders 21, and everybody knew what they meant. <laughs> With the little pause in between <laughs> the Rough right. and the Riders. Because <laughs> Ottawa had Rough Riders versus <laughs> Rough Riders. Exactly. Wouldn't you love to see those days again? I, I think we'd probably do some <laughs> retro games. We'll, we won't broadcast it. We'll just do it on radio. <laughs> just finally, 100 Grey Cups. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to the league? Wow. Um, you know, it has been an unbelievable year for us with a, with a Grey Cup train traveling across the country, with 50 million stamps in the marketplace, with a book being written by Stephen Brunt, who I believe is going to be on the show. Right after you. Um, you know, essentially what it means to us is that we want to, uh, you know, really celebrate the past, but show the Canadian public that we're really launching this league, this league for the next 100 years with the new stadiums, with the young players, with the great rivalries on the football field. You know, this great Canadian institution uh, is on strong ground and we're going to be around for a long, long time. That's Mark Cohen, Commissioner of the Canadian Football League. Thanks for visiting us at TVO tonight. Great, thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.